Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. You know, we are looking at just not just a 100% clean energy economy for Hawaii. We are leading the nation in that regard, but we've become more ambitious. We're looking at decarbonization. What in the world does that mean? We'll be covering that pretty soon. Suffice to say, it's even more ambitious. And we're going to have to do it. The nation's going to have to do it. The world is going to have to do it. So how do you address this incredible problem? We've been doing a great job in putting photovoltaic panels on roofs and in farms. We've got a decent wind regime going. And my personal uh, Kuleana is energy efficiency. We're becoming more and more and more efficient, but that ain't enough. We have to develop new technologies that go beyond anything that we have today. How in the world do we do that? We have entities that foster the development of new innovative technologies and we're going through a, just a revolution in, in, in efficiency and improvements. We, we had the atomic bomb being a revolution. Now I'm calling it the, uh, the subatomic revolution. More information in our little iPhone than NASA had at the time, all of NASA had at the time we put a man on the moon first. So we're taking advantage of this explosive development of new technologies. And who better to talk about what's going on in Hawaii and in California than Tiffany Wynn, the Director for External Affairs for Energy Accelerator. I describe it as a uh, think tank. And they specialize in emergency technologies and helping these new companies get off the ground. So, Tiffany Wynn, welcome to the program. And Hi, with, Howard. Hey, me. <laughs> I'm so delighted that you, you can be with us, and thank you. So, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Why don't you launch in first with a, an introduction? to Energy Accelerator, and then we can talk about some of the most exciting projects that, that you're working on. Take it away, Tiffany. Yeah, happy to. I think we have a few slides here um, mm -hmm. to help help everyone watching follow along. But um, just at a basic level, Elemental Accelerator is focused on equitable climate action. So we're on a mission to redesign systems at the root of climate change. And our role is to really scale equitable market-driven solutions through project funding, strategy coaching, and commercial introductions. Um, you know, so we started as an outgrowth of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative in 2009. And at that time, we were funding a lot of commercial projects with teen, clean tech companies. And we, were, we just weren't seeing them getting the commercial traction that um, we wanted. So our CEO, Don Lippert, spent actually six months traveling around the country talking to other accelerators um, about how to actually move the market for this clean, these clean tech solutions. And we were the first to apply an accelerator model to climate technologies. And we've been using Hawaii as a lab ever since. So not in the sense of experimenting on our community, but as a canvas um, where we're really learning how to solve the toughest problems in clean energy deployment and how to integrate them at a systems level. So as we've continued our mission throughout the years, we recognize that systems change really needed to be um, made to make an impact. So we expanded from um, our previous iteration of Energy Accelerator to what you see now as Elemental Accelerator. And um, we expanded that strategy to include working in the waters of sector, mobility, food and ag, and circular economy. Um, and over the past decade, we've launched um, into climate action with supporting over 100 growth stage companies or startups. Um, we've celebrated, you know, 
over a dozen ex exits um, and have deployed over 70 projects across Hawaii and Asia Pacific. And this year, we're actually expanding more globally um, with our newest cohort 10, which we'll be announcing sometime um, in late September. So the problem as we see it here um, is we know that the best solutions will be the most equitable and we need to act urgently to scale them. So we know that we have a lot of tech intelligence, but you know, we really need to work on increasing our community intelligence. And our vision is both local and global. So our goal is to really move markets and unstick old ways of working to enable rapid progress towards decarbonization. That's your buzzword there, mm -hmm. Howard. <laughs> and we utilize individual project learnings um, and broader trends to inspire action for climate tech and policy making. And so um, the next slide here is about our theory of change. So we truly believe that entrepreneurs are wired to scale at the speed needed to meet the urgency of this climate crisis. Um, and we're really working with them to redesign those systems at the root of climate that underpin our economy and really help to uplift people and planet. And we use the term accelerator a little bit differently from um, others. So we know that this is a decisive decade. We have less than 10 years to really address this climate thing. Um, so we think about acceleration in terms of ways that we can really figure out how to do all of this work faster. Um, and we see ourselves as a commercial catalyst for growth stage companies. So our role is to accelerate climate tech startups by bringing forward meaningful commercial inflection points. And every year we select 15 to 20 companies um, to support and they engage with us in three different ways. So um, through project funding, strategy coaching, and also through um, commercial introductions. And I think there's a slide here about our program track. Yes, so um, this is how um, startups can apply to our program so they can apply to us from either our strategy uh, project or global track. And we currently have 117 um, companies in our portfolio. And I think the one thing that we've learned in the past decade is that they're with 117 companies, they're all at 117 different stages. So no two companies are seeing the problem the same or in the exact same way. Um, we see a lot of commonalities through, throughout all of them, um, but we've really found that how we can support companies is by really building a community around them. And we've developed a custom coaching model where we bring in folks to help companies um, that you know generally they might not be able to afford to bring them on uh, as a startup. So we bring them on to really help them meet those different inflection points. And um, equity and access is a really, really important part of our work. So we have a slide here about our framework. Um, previously, we had an equity track that was focused on de companies deploying projects in California frontline communities. And we define frontline communities as those communities who are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. They're experiencing them right now. Um, but many times because of many factors, most oftentimes socioeconomic, they'll be the last communities to actually benefit from any of these technologies. So that's why we focus a lot of our project deployment in frontline communities. Um, and our framework really focuses on what we call equity in and equity out. So we help support companies for equity in, which focuses on things within the company itself, such as um, hiring a diverse range of perspectives on the team and um, bringing on diverse board members, as well as looking at diversification of supply chains. Um, and then we also support companies um, in coaching on equity out, which focuses on project outcomes, working with the community, creating jobs, um, creating accessible solutions and addressing any unintended consequences. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't, there's nothing, nothing ambitious about that whatsoever. I hope you have a staff of at least 100 people. You know, it's been really exciting throughout this pandemic because we've definitely been growing as a team um, as we grow, you know, this platform that we're creating of 
we've created of working at that nexus of, you know, climate change and social equity. So yeah, we're we're really excited. And um, like you mentioned earlier, we have or we work in both Hawaii and California. So we have we started in Hawaii, but a couple of years ago, 2007, 2017, uh, we opened up an office um, in East Palo Alto in California. East Palo Alto, that's <laughs> one of your higher income uh, communities. So you're starting on the right foot there. Actually, East Palo Alto is, um, I think, oh. uh, considered a frontline community. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, wow. Nothing ambitious about this. And you know, this holds so much promise. As our boss, Scott Glenn, says, we need new technology if we're going to get this done. And you are right there at, at the front lines. So we have talked about three individual projects. Should the first one be, what is it, Car Carbon Cure? Yeah, so a couple of companies that we have working in this space, um, Carbon Cure, I think is one that has just shown so much promise and is actually working here in Hawaii already. So um, they're one of the startups that entered our program and their technology is they introduce recycled CO2 into fresh concrete and they trap it in that concrete. So each mile of concrete pavement has the potential to reduce CO2 emissions by 500,000 pounds. Um, so if you think about it, that's the equivalent of driving from San Francisco to Washington DC 200 times. Um, and our project with them was in a partnership with uh, Hawaii Department of Transportation, as well as Hawaii Gas. So Hawaii Gas helped provide the recycled carbon. Um, and we poured 100, 150 cubic yards of carbon injected concrete um, next to an equivalent pour of a standard concrete mix on an access road for the Kapolei Interchange Project here on Oahu. And this test allowed Hawaii Department of Transportation to make a side-by-side -side comparison of the two combinations to determine specifications for the use of carbon injected concrete in future road projects. And actually it was really, really successful. And they found that the carbon injected material turned out to be stronger and more workable with no increase in overall cost to traditional concrete. And that was really, really exciting because it also helped us um, as we worked on a resolution actually called the Honolulu Resolution. Um, and we introduced it at the 2019 Conference of Mayors um, that basically um, mandated that future city and county projects take carbon or yeah, carbon infused concrete into consideration, basically when, you know, like going out for bids. And that, that resolution was unanimous, unanimously passed at the Conference of Mayors. Um, so it was over a hundred mayors and has just continued to, you know, snow, snowball across other jurisdictions around the nation. Mm -hmm. it's so really exciting. So is this company up and running then? Is it making money? Is it scalable? Yes, it's absolutely wow. scalable. They're actually based out of Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And they were one of the first companies that Amazon pledged um, to support as part mm -hmm. of their climate initiative. So they're, they're doing really, really well. And we're so proud of them. Wow. So they're actually, do you, you know, I, I suspect you're not an engineer, but you know how the carbon is pulled out of, of where? Is it pulled out of, of natural gas in this case or? Where, where you know, I am not an engineer, but that is a, that is where we partnered with Hawaii Gas. So I know someone mm -hmm. from their team would uh, would have um, the the answer there for you. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's they they have a system where it takes the recycled carbon and infuses it and traps it into um, the concrete itself. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is so exciting! And since this is a Canadian country company. Was the pilot project here in Honolulu, what, I mean, yeah. this standard? So I can only imagine 
that this caught the interest of just a few other municipalities. Am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, um, they've, they've really, really expanded um, their work. So there's lots of interest in this space, especially because, you know, building, we're, we're always building new buildings, right? So I think mm -hmm. this is a solution that just has so much broad um, impact here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at the production of CO2 worldwide, and especially looking at the explosive growth of uh, China as an infrastructure, you will find that the manufacture of concrete is one of the foremost producers of CO2 on a worldwide scale. Mm -hmm. So this has, to say that this has large implications is... Uh, it's an understatement. <laughs> tiny, yes. And, and it was... The cost was is comparable. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it's a real win-win. Wow. So in my totally unprejudiced uh, worldview, this should be headlines all over the world all the time. <laughs> but, uh, we agree with you there. They, they, they have had um, some really great headlines, but yeah, we we agree that more awareness, the better. Mm -hmm. And it, or it, since it started here in Honolulu, or is there is Department of Transportation counting on doing additional concrete uh, projects? With, with yeah, they've been they've been really great supporters of mm -hmm. carbon cure. So I do believe that they are using it where they can. Mm -hmm. And the next, well, first uh, highways are one obvious market, but then of course buildings, as you point out, there's yeah. a lot concrete in, in a high rise. And I think you're saying that this concrete is structurally stronger than your ordinary concrete that will thrill the heck out of uh, civil engineers. You know, when we put yeah. up a high rise, it, it's going to stay up even better than, than uh, we ordinarily planned for. Yeah, we're excited to see it in buildings yes, as you're, well. You're, you, you've got a, an exciting job on your hands here, Tiffany. <laughs> but that's only company number one. We, we had three in mind. Yeah, another one that I think is really exciting and very applicable to Hawaii is a company called Amp Air. And they, their technology is they've retrofitted um, uh, six-seater Cessna planes and made them hybrid electric. So that can cut fuel consumption and emissions by about 50%. Um, and so there's real, real opportunity here. You know, like there, we've, we've talked about alternative jet fuels and all those things, but being able to electrify aviation, I think is a really exciting space, especially since, you know, travel between islands here, um, they're all short haul flights. So we actually had um, a project with them that wrapped up just the end of last year and we did a pilot where they did a, they flew a commercial route between Hana and Kahului for a month and that helped them to um, get their FAA experimental market survey um, certification so that basically allowed Amp Air to fly um, their crew and essential personnel um, for this training and exploratory market activity and um, after our pilot with them wrapped a little earlier this year, I think around February, they actually announced that they were acquired by a company called Surf Air, which is really exciting. So with half of all US flights uh, being 500 miles or less, I think hybrid electric technology will have broad and immediate um, impact. So mm -hmm. we're, we're excited to, to see these flights uh, go commercial, hopefully in the next couple of years. Wow. You know, when you look at uh, annual airline safety ratings, generally Hawaiian Airlines comes in number one, and this is especially before they were going to the mainland, why they're short haul. Number two, we have the most beautiful weather in the world. We don't have blinding snowstorms in Chicago or, or hurricanes in Florida. So we do on time safety, almost perfect. So I would think that for an experimental type 
technology like this, Hawaii just would be a, a dreamland pilot project. So may, maybe they'll start uh, start small with us and then expand from there. Yeah, uh, I hope so. Their journey started with us. So um, <laughs> we hope that we'll see more of these hybrid electric planes in the air very, very soon. You know, some years ago, when the earlier energy office was, was looking at uh, energy self-sufficiency, we'd said, well, we've got electricity. We're making real progress on there. Uh, with uh, ground transportation, we've got biodiesel and we've got electric vehicles. Okay, great promise there. And then we look up into the sky and say, ah, we'll never be able to do anything about aviation. <laughs> and when tourism is at its peak, almost a third of all the fossil fuel consumed in Hawaii is aviation fuel because we're a small state with a huge airport and what, 10, 10 million visitors. So we thought it was just a kind of a hopeless case. But as I pointed out earlier, technology is rising so rapidly. Do you have any idea, again, you're not an engineer about the hybrid, system, I would think that there would be there would be a combination of really high density batteries that take over when they can take over, and then a normal jet engine, maybe to uh, basically to take off, and then maybe the batteries can take over when they're cruising. Do you, you have any idea how, how that works? You know, I'm going to leave that to the Ampere guys. <laughs> I would hate to give you the wrong answer there, but it's, it's interesting. I, I just went to Lanai this weekend, and of course, they fly the smaller aircrafts uh, to that airport. And I, the entire time, I was just thinking how cool it would be for the next time, you know, we hop over to Lanai to be able to fly an Ampere plane. And think of the publicity. Wow, you know, people love to be pioneers. Elon Musk and the boys are selling their space flights. And they're only going 55,000 feet up and then coming right back down again. They're paying, what, a quarter million dollars for, for this experience. People might be just clamoring to get on such a, a plane just to say, I did it. I was one of the pioneers in this and take photos. And that would add to our, our high-end uh, uh, tourism market. Just yeah, like, absolutely. Wow. Hmm. Exciting stuff again. And we've got still some more time. For <laughs> Something about pulling water out of air. Of course, we yes. have a lot of water <laughs> out there. So how in the world does that work? So this next one, one of my personal favorites, this company is called Source Global. Uh, they were previously called Zero Mass Water. And we did a project with them actually in Australia, but they do have um, installations here in state um, on a couple of the islands actually. So their technology is they have hydro panels and they look really, really similar to solar panels. So what those panels do is they extract water vapors from the air to make mineralized um, and to actually just make clean drinking water. And uh, um, an average array can replace up to 600 bottles of water a month. So in our project with Source, um, they were, uh, we helped fund the installation of panels in a really drought stricken area of Australia, where they would normally have to truck in pallets of water bottles um, every single week for the community there. Um, so with Source's technology, they were basically able to make a completely new ecosystem for clean drinking water, which also provided you know, economic benefits because it created new jobs and they actually created um, a business out of it. So now this facility um, bottles water for nearby resorts um, in the area. So mm -hmm. it's really, really great because you know, with this community scale type of array um, provides a lot of resiliency to the drinking water system. And you know, it helps with challenges of access and quality and just overall reliability of drinking water for many um, frontline communities. So we're, we're super jazzed about 
the potential for source as well. Uh, you, you know, what's fascinating about that is you would think that the water from air would be best extracted in humid environments, like a tr tropical environment. There's plenty of moisture. The moisture content in a lot of places is up around the 80%. But the area, I've certainly been to the Australian desert. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. darn dry. I would guess that the moisture content in that air is called relative humidity is less than 30%. And yet, you can extract water from it. Yeah. Exactly where that water is needed, you can still do, do your extraction. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a great solution. And actually, if anybody um, is on Oahu here, the new Patagonia location um, has a couple of hydro panels up. So you can bring in your reusable uh, water bottle and fill it up in store with uh, sources water if you want to try it out wow. yourself. Hmm. Where, where is the Patagonia store? It's um, on Ward Avenue. So it's a big yellow building, I believe, on Ward. Hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, they're, they're a known pioneer in all kinds of clean uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. hmm. So let's see. Oh, does the, uh, the air... Uh, plane that was going between uh, Kahului and Hana, did that fly just the crew or did they actually f have some cargo in there to make it? So it's a cargo route, but I believe mm -hmm. they just flew the crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And let's see. Oh, jobs, jobs. We're constantly talking about the creation of green jobs and especially this carbon cure. I think it sounds like it's creating a job or two. I, I have absolutely no idea how it works, but you know, I think they could make some extra income just by offering tours of, of the plant. Yeah, I mean, we see yeah. workforce development as a huge, mm -hmm. just um, positive outcome of, you know, all of the technologies that are coming out and the industries that are being built. So, you know, this moment in climate, um, I think is going to be about jobs. And it's really great that we've actually heard that echoed as well um, from, you know, President Biden. Uh, he said, when I think about climate change, I think about jobs. And mm -hmm. that's a great example, um, or actually a great example of a company that we have in our portfolio um, that's helping with workforce development is a company called Charger Help. So you know how um, uh, many times EV charging stations, the frustration with getting an EV is charging it, right? Or like that charge anxiety that you have. And when you go up, whether you're in a shopping center or somewhere else and you see the charger is down, drives you crazy, makes you not want to have an EV. So Charger Help actually um, deploys a workforce and they're building out a workforce um, of folks that go out and can um, fix EV chargers. So just retooling hmm. lots of folks um, from different industries to have green jobs here. Wow. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. One thing we're pushing, pushing, pushing is the purchase of EVs, but the main uh, drawback, as you said, is what is it called? My mileage insecurity. Where am I going to find another uh, char charger down, down the road here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're nearing the end of our uh, time, Tiffany. Uh, this is, you, you're just giving us a great glimpse in, into the future. And I think it, it, it gives us all hope because very often the odds look absolutely insurmountable uh, against us. But uh, here, here you are. Do you have any uh, parting uh, words of, of wisdom? 
Yeah, you know, I know this yeah. chat was all about decarbonization and something that I heard Scott Glenn from your office say really recently is a lot of people think that, you know, our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2045, but it's really to be carbon negative. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, you know, just clarification is so important um, in the work that we're doing. And I would really just love to commend you and your office for, you know, helping to lead the way here and I feel like this chat just went by so quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, well, you know, if I have you on again, I bet in six or eight months, you'll have new stories to tell because you'll have a, a new co cohort uh, go going for you. Yes, cohort 10. So we are in the final rounds of our due diligence right now. Um, so yes, if we talk to you in six to eight months, we will have a whole new crop of really mm -hmm. exciting technologies to share with you. Wow. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Tiffany Wynn, for being an absolutely fascinating guest that gives us hope in a time when things seem sometimes overwhelming. You're a beam of light out there. <laughs> so thank you on behalf of Think Tech Hawaii Code Green Howard Wig. See you again. 